All new Dr. Phil. Reunited with the son she placed for adoption. He'll put his arm around her. We make cookies together. I do find it creepy. We cuddle on the couch. That's crossing boundaries. They're not like a mother and son. Your daughter said he gave her a hickey. It wasn't um, a hickey. He pinched me or bit me. They have sleepovers. Did y'all sleep in the same bed? Yes, once. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. Hey, hey. Hey, what's up? So I just found out something interesting and new about Allie. I found this story that passed by my desk about this family. Dan, he contacted the show about his wife. She placed a little baby boy, John, for adoption when she was 15 years old. This is John. They reconnected just two years ago, and the reunion was so wonderful, apparently, in the beginning. But then... Dan, who wrote to the show, said things took a dark turn. Dan says their relationship is inappropriate because they act more like girlfriend-boyfriend than mother and son. Just kissing mom on the cheek. They say that he gave her a hickey on the neck and they're also cuddling on the couch while watching TV under a blanket. Apparently they're inseparable. Now, John, I have to tell you also, this is important, he's autistic. But he does have issues with violence. He gave Lori a black eye last year. And Dan said he may walk out of the marriage. So when Allie came in, she wanted to, she was pitching an adoption story and said she could re relate um, because she herself found out that she had a sister. Oh, really? When I was young, I found out that my mom, when she was 20 years old, she placed a baby for adoption, a little girl. I found out about it when I was around 14 years old and I was curious about boys <laughs> and my mom wanted to have uh, the talk with me and then about 10 years ago in my early 30s I did meet my sister Anne and we started exchanging emails. Oh, wow, she does look like your sister. <laughs> yeah. We exchanged. I like that you guys took letters. your time with this and you actually thought through how to reunite. We slowly got to know each yeah. other. So you stair-stepped into it yes. correctly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we, how do you get along now? Great. We think of each other as close friends and sisters, mm -hmm. but we haven't merged our families. You did it right and you've put up boundaries, so it's working. That ship has sailed with this family. I think the story's worth doing. And how old is he? He's 26 now. Yeah, well, cuddling with your brother on the couch at 26. They watch Dr. Phil and The Bachelor. They need to watch it in different chairs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to jump to conclusions, but if you're really snuggling on the couch, that could be creepy. The hickey is a little... Well, yeah, if that's going on, that's... Yeah, concerning. Let's peg it to creep meter. Well, yeah, let's proceed. And But I really would like to know the adoptive family's wishes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now, you pitched this story yesterday, and I've read all the show materials in detail, and I've studied the situation, and I do have a plan. I'm curious, do you have tape I can look at of them interacting? Right here, right, yes. Let's see it. My husband, Dan, needs to realize he's pushing me closer to my son, John. John says he loves me and he wants to spend time with me. My son cares more about me than my own husband. John and I are very affectionate. He hugs me, kisses me. We cuddle on the couch. My family will say we're gross, disgusting, creepy, and I don't feel that at all. If you don't like me and my son hugging or cuddling, then look the other way. That's crossing boundaries. I want to talk to these people. Let, let bring it, let's, let's have them come out before we start, because I don't want John involved in all of this, but I do want to talk to them. Hi, Dr. Phil. Hi. How are you? Hi. Dan, Lori, I want to introduce you to Dr. Phil. Lori, Dr. Dr. Phil, how are you? Dr. Dan, how are you nice doing? Nice to meet you. Um, I kind of wanted to talk to you guys just a little bit to the side before John and others get involved. I need a bit of a backstory here. Yeah. Because I was just watching a bit of tape with you curled up with him on the couch, and mm -hmm. it does look unusual. Mm -hmm. Do you agree that it seems unusual? Well, I wouldn't be like that with my daughters, but... Let's sit down before we go on to the, the main stage. And I've got a little separate studio here we can pop into. Um, 
This is actually my podcast studio where I do other kind of interviews, but we can borrow it for a few minutes here. You all just have a seat over there, if you will. Okay. Um, you placed this child for adoption at what age? I placed him up for adoption when I was four, 15. When you were 15, and he, this was at birth? Yeah. So he went from the hospital to the adoptive family? Yes, he did. And this was not an open adoption? It was open where I had pictures <clears throat> and letters every year. Okay, but no visitation? No visitation. Just pictures and letters. Until how long ago? Until seven years ago. Okay, and then you started... Being on social media with each other. Oh, just on social media. And he found you or you found him? He found me originally, I believe. Okay. And how long did you talk on social media before you actually met in person? We talked on social media for about a year, uh -huh. and then his adopted parents found out and made him block us. So okay. we were blocked for about a year, and then we were on social media for about four years. Okay, so they were not supportive. No. Of, and why do you think that is? Because they knew about his disabilities, and they didn't know, and they were scared that I would take him away from them. After meeting him... What was your initial feeling? What was your initial reaction? When I first met him, I was like a huge weight off my shoulders, and my heart felt complete. And <clears throat> when he hugged me, it was just a big connection. Okay. And, and Dan, I'm going to hear from you plenty, because uh, uh, I, I want to hear everything you have to sure. say about yep. this, but I'm kind of wanting to get the backstory here. Um, do you think, you, you said that, you curl up on the couch in a blanket with him. It's been described as, as cuddling. You said, I wouldn't do that with my girls. No, I wouldn't. Then why do you do it with him? Because we're just close and we, I don't know, we had an instant bond and it's just a different kind of relationship because I met him two years ago and I missed the first 24 years. So it's almost like I have my baby <clears throat> back. So we're just extra close. You're playing catch up. Yeah. Some of these reunions go well. Some of them don't go well. Some of them are like, wow, I wish I was back before we reunited here. I don't think this is one of those situations, but I think this could go off the rails. And you have to do things in a way that respects each other's lives, each other's histories. And Shaq's a really good friend of mine. We've known each other a long time. We've done a movie together. We've, hang, we have a good time. But I did a, a podcast interview with him and he had not known his biological father. And he talked about that and what he had to do stepwise. And it's very relevant here. So I wanted you to hear this and then tell me what you think about what he has to say. Let's take a look. So my mother calls me, says, you need to meet your biological. I'm like, well, I'm good. 47, I got six kids, mom. It's all good. So it's like, okay, I meet him. And then the crazy thing is, in North New Jersey, there's this restaurant that I always go to, a soul food restaurant. And there was a guy in there, a chef. He always used to look at me and just start crying. And he was my father's best friend. Really? And my biological father lived upstairs. So one day we go to the restaurant, we have a good conversation. And it ain't about what happened, because I've learned you can't judge a man. I don't judge. You know, he, he had some problems when he was young. I don't judge him. I don't follow him. You know, my thing now is just that as long as we're both here, we just get to know each other. I don't ask him what happened. I know what happened, but I don't ask him. We don't talk about it, and I don't, hey, man, how come you? I'm not the judge and the jury. My job is to just love him as, as, as much as I can now. Do you talk to him occasionally? Probably, probably once every other week. Oh, really? Yeah, because he's sort of like me. I don't like to bother people. He just, you know, he'll, he'll call me, hey, what's up, man? What's happening? What you doing? So you get along when he's there? You yeah, talk about course. stuff? No, we don't talk about anything. Just eat, have a good time. Has he met your children? He met my oldest daughter. But she was glad to meet him? Yes. Yeah, it's good to I mean the history. Yes. You, know, you yes. got your roots. I mean, it's you see your history, whether she's active with him or not, at least she knows that piece yeah. of the puzzle, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'll, and th that's a, a, a brief excerpt from that, and I'll tell you what he went on to say. Um, I asked him if he had met all of his children yet. He said, no, he hasn't met all of my children yet, and I haven't moved him in with us. I haven't, you know, integrated him fully into our lives, but I'm taking this a step at a time because... When adults meet, they have to build a relationship across time, 
and I'm respecting my family who have not known him and I'm respecting his life because he has a pattern and friends and so we're taking this a step at a time and making sure that neither of us disrespect, disrupt or dishonor the lives and families that we have. What do you think about his philosophy there? Shaq's a very bright and sensitive guy, by the way, and nobody counseled him about that. That's just the way he approached it. What do you think yeah, about what he said? I think that's a good idea, but, I mean, it's been two years now, and he did rush himself and the family. Mm-hmm. It was kind of moved all so fast. We saw each other once a month at first, but the first six months, then he moved to the town. Okay. Well, I've got some questions about that, and then I have a question or two for Dan here. Uh, Dan is the one who wrote into the show, and he has some serious concerns about this relationship at many different levels, it's not just the affection between the two, not just that it seems like they're the couple instead of this being the couple, uh, but some other concerns, some that have to do with safety. We'll talk about all that right after the break. If you ask me, Lori is obsessed with John. John loves to show Lori affection. He'll hold her hand, he'll put his arm around her. I do find it creepy. Lori's been attacked by John. This is one adoption reunion that has gone off the rails. Dan reached out to me because he has problems with the relationship that his wife Lori has with her son that she recently reunited with, recently being two years. Here's what he has to say. This relationship with Lori and John is tearing the family apart. John definitely has injected himself into our family. Lori wants John to be included in absolutely everything we do. John moved to the town we lived six months after we had met him. He had changed a portion of his last name to include my last name, which we all thought was pretty odd. John and I are just inseparable. We have such a strong connection. Lori and John spend hours on the phone with each other. John and I hang out at home. We do chores together. We watch TV together like Dr. Phil and The Bachelor. We make cookies. We make pies together. If you ask me, Lori is obsessed with John. Lori has totally been consumed with John's life, leaving me and my girls like we're taking a backseat. John loves to show Lori affection. He'll hold her hand, he'll put his arm around her, kiss her cheeks. We'll sit together under a blanket and we'll watch TV close together. I just call it being close. It makes us happy. It does cross a boundary. I do find it creepy. John is violent. Lori's been attacked by John over the past two years at least a dozen times. He has hit me, he has choked me, he's bit me. I've had a bruise on my arm or on my face. One time I was bit in my face, one time on my chest. John has threatened to stab me before. About six months ago, John got upset and he turned around and backhanded me with his elbow in my eye. I got a huge black eye. I was just fed up. Got in my car and went over to John's house and returned the favor and punched him. He ended up with a concussion and a split forehead. He's very unpredictable and never know when or what will trigger him to go off. That's not true because he's never been dangerous around anybody except for me. Yet. If you ask me, this is one adoption reunion that has gone off the rails. Does he have a right to be concerned here? He has a right to be concerned with my safety, yes. But I don't feel like we are creepy in any way. What is your greatest concern here? Well, my ultimate greatest concern is for my wife's safety. You say this has gotten to the point that this could actually threaten the marriage. It pretty much already has. Already has. Yes. And what about it threatens the marriage? Um, I mean, it could be a little bit of my jealousy over their relationship and what she doesn't show to me as much anymore. She is affectionate with him. She's physically affectionate with him. She loves him, loves on him, hugs him, pats him. I almost feel like I'm kind of competing with another man to date my wife almost. If you didn't know, if you were, if you didn't know this was mother and son, biological mother and son, and you watched this not knowing that, you might conclude this was a couple, correct? Would you agree with that? If you didn't know. Yeah. If you just looked at it blind, you'd say, you know, cute couple. We've had, you know, friends of ours and people say to us, you know, that they almost look more like the couple. Like when they post pictures online, on social media, they'll say, you know, it looks like 
you know, they're dating more than, you know, you two are. And she's not this way with you. I used to um, be. We, we were at one point, yes, very much. But not now. Not as much now at all, no. Didn't you say at one point that he gave her a hickey? Um, the she's daughter has, said, your daughter she's said She's had that. stuff on her neck, but I, I don't know. Well, your daughter it, said that it was a hickey. It wasn't a hickey. Well, what was it? He, he pinched me. What bit me? I've made a list, actually, uh, of the alleged abuse. This is according to you. April 2017, you scream to him to get off your arm. March 18, bruises are seen on your forearm. Summer 2018, you get a black eye from John. Well, I don't think he meant to give me a black eye. He turned around and got me right in the eye. But it was in anger. That's when you went over and punched him in the face. Yes. Because you thought, you hit my wife, I'm going to punch you in the face. It so. was a, a, a lot of built up <clears throat> After times. the fifth time, probably. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, this is the final straw for me. Okay. Then October 18, he bites you on the cheek. And what was the motive for that? What, what, was, his, what was behind him biting because you on the cheek? Because I was trying to leave his house. How is that okay with you? It's not okay with me. The two of you had exchanges on text... You say, what do I tell Dan about this? Then, John, nothing. Lori, well, that, that one, John, stop. Lori, no. Lori, help. John, don't get me screwed. Lori, just say I don't know. Lori, he's going to ask. John, nothing. Lori, well, what if he asks? John, don't say anything. So you guys so are I talking do. about, are we going to cover this up? Yeah, I do try to keep it a secret. It now has gotten to the point that the two of them are conspiring to betray you exactly. by having secrets from you, her husband. Tell me how, in your mind, that's okay. Because whenever they found out, they start calling him names and they start hating him and they don't welcome him in my house. And it hurts me. Do you recognize that this is going in a, in a bad direction family-wise? And so you're saying, I I'm willing to jeopardize my relationship with the family that I have been with for all of these years in favor of this relationship here. That's not what I want to do. But it's what you are doing. The way you're doing this is setting this up for failure 100%. And you're going to wind up with both of these guys out of your life wondering, what the hell was I thinking? And I want to stop you from doing that. All right, I want to meet John. And it's time to hear from him. He has a lot to say as well. Uh, so I, I, I hope you're going to be open-minded so this can be a win-win for everybody. Uh, we'll be right back. Mom and I have the most amazing relationship you could ever have. I feel like she's my best friend. People say behind my back, they think we're a boyfriend girlfriend. All I really want is my family to accept me for who I am. I mean, my greatest fear is that one day I'll wake up and they'll all be gone. Lori and I have gone to marriage counseling to try to deal with the best ways of handling John. One of the therapists were concerned about John's violent outbursts. We have been warned from the consequences of what may happen. One counselor even suggested that Lori and John only be together in public for Lori's safety. But John and I both disagree because we love spending time alone together. That's when we can be most ourselves. What stunned me the most is when Lori said, if my son takes my life, then that's it's my time to go, and I'm okay with that.
Swear I won't forget this Why do I regret this? In my mind reckless Thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless Anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless Betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open I hate being broken I feel like an ocean Filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion Rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking Reopen The scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I know my son John's not going to hurt anybody. I'm a big girl, and I know how to handle myself. Well, Lori and her husband Dan say their marriage has suffered since Lori reunited with her biological son John two years ago. Now, Dan says his wife and stepson's relationship is, in his opinion, inappropriate and actually dangerous. And so let's hear what John has to say about this. This is the son. Let's hear what he has to say. I really remember well meeting my mom for the first time. We had this instant bond. Mom and I had the most amazing relationship you could ever have. I feel like she's my best friend. People say behind my back, they think we're a boyfriend, girlfriend, which is not true. Mom and I get along maybe 75% of the time. If she says something or does something I don't like, I'll immediately explode into it. One time, I elbowed her. She immediately had a black eye. Dan came over, elbowed me in the face, like punched punch me in the face as hard as he could, which in fact gave me a broken nose. There was blood everywhere. And now I have a permanent scar of that. Man, right, right there. All I really want is my family to, to accept me for who I am. I mean, my greatest fear is that one day I'll wake up and they'll all be gone. Well, John, good to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, you say your biggest fear is that one day you'll wake up and they'll all be gone. Why do you think that would happen if it did happen? Just, it's been said. I don't mean. Yeah. Do you think you're welcome in the home? No. You don't think you're welcome in the home? And why not? I just feel like I'm like a second person, like a th third wheel, like, I don't, like an outsider. Uh-huh. And you say that you think that Dan is jealous of you. Um, why, why do you think he's jealous? I just feel like he's jealous of the fact that Mom and I spend so much time together and it's, it's, that it's interfer interfering with things. She placed you for adoption at birth when she was very young. Do you feel that she should feel guilty about it? No. H how do you feel about him saying that? I feel good about it. Uh-huh. 
But at one time you did say, how could you do that to me? You didn't want me. Uh-huh. And, but the, but the question's been answered. How could you do that? And, and the question's been answered. I was a child myself, and I wanted better for you than I could give you. Uh, so I made the sacrifice to place you with people that were better equipped than me. You answered that question, and you accepted that Except, answer, yeah. right? So that, that's what happened. And so, you know, guilt is something for you to do. It's not something that you can build a relationship on. You obviously made the right call. Yeah. Right? You have problems with aggression sometimes, it, right? It, correct. And it's usually with the people that are closest to you. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that is? Why do you think it's the people that are closest to you? Do I trust them the most? Uh huh. And so why aggress against those people? Because I know they won't go anywhere. I know they'll always be there. So you know that you can get away with it? I, mean, I don't like having it happen, but it just, it's just part of who I am. What's your relationship with Dan? Not really any relationship at all. Do you think you should work on a relationship with him? Yeah. Do you respect him enough to say, I, I, I need to respect the man, this is his wife, and his family, and if I want to be part of it, I need to, I need to make an effort to fold into it. Makes sense. Okay, let's take a break. Coming up, Dan and Lori's daughter say their mom and half-brother have a toxic relationship. They say it's not healthy. So let's hear what they have to say when we come back. First, the girls were very accepting of John. They were so happy for me. That all changed when they found out how he has been violent towards their mother. My own daughters don't want John to be part of the family because they're very jealous of him. There's a new man in their life, and they don't like how he's violent, and they don't like how close we are. Now it's just like they don't accept me as anything. Like, I feel like I'm a complete outsider. They call me gross, scary monster. I feel like it's very hard to be a family when I'm the only one with love for John. John's not going anywhere. He's going to be a part of our family forever. Now, joining the conversation uh, are Lori and Dan's daughters, Ashley and Stephanie. Ashley, let me start with you. You're there. You see what goes on. Uh, what do you? What about this bothers you? Um, my biggest concern with everything is that he's strong. He's a big guy. He has the power to kill my mom if he really wanted to. And my sister is around him a lot, and I don't want her to get hurt. I have two very young children who I'm starting to be scared to have around them when he's there because we don't know what could happen. How do you two get along with John? Do you have a relationship with him? We don't have a we relationship. We don't have one at all. And why not? Uh, we're scared of him. And Ashley, you say that John and Lori sometimes sleep in the same bed. Yes, um, I've heard that, but I didn't obviously see it because I'm not there. Uh-huh. And yeah, how... They have sleepovers. He has his own room at our house. Right. Yeah. When you sleep over his house? I slept over his house one time. And did y'all sleep in the same bed? Yes, once. Yeah. Okay. And um, that, that bothers you guys? They're not like a mother and son. And everybody around can see that. And I feel like she's trying to start from the beginning. Like, she's with a five-year-old treating him like a little kid. And he's not. He's a, he's a grown man. She should treat him that way. Dan, what do you think about that? I don't want to say, like, we're jealous, but, I mean, it is kind of resentful to see all the attention that she gives, and, and their concerns are valid. I mean, he, he can snap almost at any time. I mean, right. just a couple of days that we've been here, he, we've witnessed it. What's happened since you've been here? He was on the phone with his adoptive parents, and he was getting loud. And he told them that if he can't afford where he lives, then he's moving in with us. And I said, no, you're not. And he says, yes, I am. Mom already said I can. And I got upset, so I left the room. She went to grab the phone, and he ripped it out of her hand and grabbed her hair and ended up hurting her. And instead of blaming him, she blamed me for leaving. Okay. What do you think about that, John? I felt like it. It was the wrong, thing, the wrong thing to do. I mean, I felt like it was the worst thing I could ever, ever, ever done to her. I felt like it was 
just like in a split second, I just, just reacted react in a split, that split second, it was like the wrong way. The one thing you said is that you, you lost John once and that you don't want to do that again. And I said to you that I didn't think that you could sabotage this relationship anymore if you tried. You're well intended, but you're going to have to make some changes and you're going to have to make some changes or this isn't going to work. Uh, Dan and Lori say they want their marriage and family to get back to where it once was, but how can that happen? Well, I, I have some ideas about that that include John and, and everybody can be comfortable with it. We'll be right back. Giving up a child for adoption is the hardest thing I've ever done. I lived with so much guilt. Lori struggles with everything that she had missed. Birthdays, holidays, milestones. My mom needs to understand that giving up for adoption was the, probably the best thing she could have done. I don't hold a grudge against it. I feel like it was the most thoughtful thing she could ever do. Lori definitely lets him get away with a lot of bad behavior. I mean, he gets away with hurting me. She's over it in an hour later, and they're right back to normal. That is true. Lori needs to deal with these guilt issues before she loses her daughters and grandchildren and me. She may lose all of us if things don't change quickly. It's apparent to me that you're very intelligent here. I said there are some other challenges. Uh, you have been diagnosed as being on the spectrum, autism spectrum, and with what in the past has been referred to as Asperger's. Correct. That's bit of a dated term, but we'll use it because that's how you were originally diagnosed. And when we talk about the autism spectrum disorder, I, I want to go into that in a minute, but you've had that diagnosis for a good while, correct? Since age of four, yeah. Yeah. And um, so I, I'm going to ask you, the things that you're experiencing now with, with John in terms of aggression and getting violent at times and that didn't just start in the last two years, no. right? You, you've had problems it's before. Been, it's been since age of four. It's been the same, same it's been ever since. It's been the same. Right. And have you ever aggressed against your adoptive mother? Yes. It, it just kind of comes on you and you have trouble modulating it. Now, I'm not a big one for medication, but I know that it can be very helpful in, in this particular uh, circumstance. And you were on medication for a good while, but you've stopped taking it uh, in, the, in the recent past, correct? Correct. And have you encouraged him to not take the medication? Sometimes. You don't really have any training in neurology or autism, no. correct? No. And I'm, I'm saying that to point out the fact that um, there are protocols to really manage and modulate this appropriately yeah and I I'm guessing you're not well versed no in but we made sure the psychiatrist took him off the meds I didn't do it well I, I would like the name of the psychiatrist that said do not take any medications if you're on the autism spectrum with this if, if you had someone that said no medication you're fine I want the name of that person. Can you give that to me? No, she didn't tell him to not take any meds. She took him off like four different ones. Okay, her, so she took her, him off her, some. Her, 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 her thing was, John, I'm, I can prescribe them to you. If, you. if you want to take them, it'll help you. If you, want to take them, if you don't want to take them, that's, that's on you. So she said, if you take these, it will help you. Right, if you don't, if take you them, don't that's, that's on, on you. you. Correct. That there doesn't sound to me like don't take medicine your medication. That, he took that caused his... That's kind of like, here's the law, if you want to break it, that's on you. Yeah. Right. Um, and I'm saying this because, they're, listen, they're, they can give you so much medication, you're a zombie. Or you can dial in certain medications at the right level, carefully, carefully prescribed, and it can really help with the aggression and impulse control, along with some other things that can really, really help and make you much less reactive and explosive.
talking about the autism spectrum disorder, and uh, I want to add someone to the conversation here to discuss this with me, and this is Dr. Frank Lawless. Now, Dr. Lawless is the chairman of the Dr. Phil Advisory Board. Uh, we have an advisory board here of the top minds in psychology, psychiatry, medicine, sociology, theology, all of the different disciplines. And uh, Dr. Lawless is the co-founder of the Lawless PVP and P Center. He is also author of The Autism Answer. And The Autism Answer is a really important book because I believe Dr. Lawless is one of the foremost autism experts on the planet. And he's joining us uh, via Polycom right now. Dr. Lawless, when we talk about the autism spectrum disorder, you talk about the diagnostic triad, and uh, we're gonna put that up and, and talk about that. And Dr. Lawless, you say uh, the diagnostic triad, the first is there is a lack of social skills, correct? That is absolutely correct, and that's a uh, that comes from a neurological diagnosis as well. So we're not only talking about uh, behavior, but we're also talking about some of the causes. Right, and this is a manifestation of a brain mechanism referred to as mu. The mu manifests itself when you have this kind of lack of ability to deal with uh, social skills, and is uh, one of the major features of autism. So what we're saying is there's a neurological thing here, Lori, where people that are on the spectrum, they don't have the ability to look at what's going on around them and say, this is successful behavior, I could emulate this. It's how we learn social behavior, and that's not something that, that folks on the autism spectrum can do, and that's a neurological deficit. It's not psychological, it's neurological, so a medication can really help there, and if you take that away, then you take away their ability to start behaving more appropriately. Now, Dr. Lawless, the second in the triad is sensory processing problems. Can you talk about those just real quickly? Well, basically, this is uh, how you, your, your brain basically can process information and data uh, in a proper way. And I, I usually use the example of going to a grocery store where the normal person would see a lot of color, a lot of lights, a lot of things. Uh, in an autistic kid, uh, basically, all these things uh, overwhelm them. And so this causes a lot of anguish, anxiety, and, uh, uh, and they don't have any behavior way of dealing with this. When they feel the anxiety and feel overwhelmed, then they don't have the ability to inhibit aggression, and that's when you see the explosive behavior. That's absolutely right. It does not mean that there is a lack of intellectual ability. It does not mean that there is a lack of communication skills. So we, we know, and I, I'm meeting John here and talking to him, and I've, I've commented, and you've been watching and listening. Uh, he is quite intelligent and has an excellent vocabulary. So he understands completely, and he can say what he needs to say and understand what's said to him. So when, just because someone's on the autism spectrum, don't make a mistake of thinking that they're not intelligent and cannot say what they mean and mean what they say, true? That's absolutely true, and it's very important to know, again, that's a neurological issue, uh, not a total psychological maladjustment. Can there be a healthy way to reverse any damage this reunion may have done to this family? And I said I thought Lori was setting this up for absolute failure, that it was going to hit a wall and her worst fears were going to come true. What do I mean by that? and how can she get off of that crash course? We'll be right back. Here's why I say this is going to crash if you don't change what you're doing. You are over-involved with John. You are physically, mentally, emotionally, behaviorally, over-intensively involved with him. That cannot and will not continue. And when that steps back, he's going to feel abandoned 
and he's not going to handle it well because he is on the autism spectrum and frustration is not something he handles well. So he's going to explode when that happens and it's going to be real ugly and something is, is going to happen that's going to put him in a bad spot. He deserves better than that. So what you should do is everybody should work together and say, you know, we're, we're, let's welcome John to this family in a healthy, appropriate way. John, uh, I said Dr. Lawless, in my opinion, is the foremost autism expert in the world. And I am willing to send you to the PNP Center and have you evaluated by Dr. Lawless and his team, get you regulated on the minimum required medications, and they're gonna throw eight medications at you. They're gonna figure out exactly what your brain reacts to the best. They're gonna give you additional tools that you can do on your own. And some of this involves sound, some of it is biofeedback type things. And then I would like to bring a family therapist into this situation that can set up some rules and guidelines for this integration for you to be part of this family long term. You like my plan or yours? Yours. Okay, we'll do mine. All right. I want to thank all of my guests today and a special thanks to Dr. Frank Lawless. He is the author of The Autism Answer as well as the director of the PNP Center. And I want to thank, uh, Dr. Lawless, I want to thank you and your entire team at PNP Center. Give my best to Dr. Peavy as well. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to my new podcast. It's called Fill in the Blanks. And thanks to all of you, uh, it's the number one podcast in America. So um, you saw my interview with Shaq earlier. Uh, wait until you see what we have in store for you this week. You're going to love it. Hey, I'm really excited about my podcast for tomorrow because it is Living by Design, chapter number three. One and two are available. You can listen to them. But this is chapter number three. Each of them stand alone, by the way. And I've got four numbers for you. 14,600, 10, 7, and 5. Now, those are important numbers because 14,600 is how many days you've lived if you're 40 years old. But they don't all stick out. Only certain ones do. And the 1075 are going to be important because I'm going to be talking to you about the 10 defining moments you've had in your life, the seven critical choices you've made, and the five pivotal people that you've encountered along the way. We're going to be talking about who, how, and when people have written on the slate of who you are. And you're going to be finding out how you got to be who you are. And you're going to take one personality test on this podcast and find out some things about your personality. The congruency test to see how congruent you are living your life with what you really want it to be. So that's on tomorrow's podcast, Living by Design number three. You don't want to miss this. You will not be the same by the time you finish. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. I interview celebrities, notable figures, anyone with an interesting point of view. Uh, I really sit down and just talk to you. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, if I get in crisis, I sure wish I could talk to Dr. Phil. I'm actually doing that on the podcast because I'm sitting down and saying, if you're in crisis, if something's happening in your life, here's what you need to do. And uh, I'm really having a good time doing that, and it's really been well received. So I'm doing some of that as well. We'll see you next time.